So it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Josie Rawls. Josie is an associate lecturer in, in the, our department here in York at the Department of Physics, specializing in radio astronomy and high energy astrophysics. So this evening, she'll be talking about the fundamental concepts of radio astronomy, exploring how we can build telescopes the size of the Earth, and she'll present some current areas of research from fast radio bursts to extragalactic jets and quasars. So over to you, Josie. Thanks very much, Karen. Good evening, everyone, and thanks very much to the organizers for the invitation to talk to you all this evening about radio astronomy. And congratulations again to all of those who have received awards. I'm uh, Josie Rawls, and as Kieran said, I'm an associate lecturer here in the Department of Physics. So my research is very much in the field of radio astronomy, but I still remember the first time it kind of clicked in my mind that there are parts of the universe that are not only invisible to us because they're so far away, but because they're emitting light in regions of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes can't detect. So the image you can see on the screen is a Hubble te telescope image of the elliptical galaxy Hercules A. So that's at the center of this image. Now this galaxy is about 2 billion light years away, but, uh, and it's an optical image, which means that the light is emitted at wavelengths that our eyes can detect. So you're seeing all the light from the stars, uh, the billions of stars within this galaxy. And if this galaxy were a lot closer to us, we would be able to see it with our own eyes. Now, this galaxy is about a thousand times more massive than uh, our own Milky Way, um, but it kind of looks quite ordinary. So similar to other galaxies we would detect uh, by Hubble. So uh, similar to lots of the other galaxies in this image. Now this galaxy is far from ordinary, however, because if we look at it at radio wavelengths, we see something completely different. So the purple image you can now see shows massive radio jets, and these are extending millions of light years out into the universe. So the jets completely dwarf the visible galaxy from which they're coming out of. And these jets are really high energy plasma beams. So subatomic particles and magnetic fields that are shooting out at nearly the speed of light from the center of the black hole at the center of the uh, galaxy. Now we'll come back to radio jets a bit later on then, but as you can see that there, there are these massive structures in our universe that are completely invisible to the eye, but play a hugely important role in the evolution of our galaxies and can reveal information like uh, about very elusive objects such as black holes. Now I'm sure most of you have covered the electromagnetic spectrum before, um, but we'll have a quick recap just so that we can put into context where radio waves sit um, in comparison to other forms of light. So I'm going to attempt here to draw a line that just shows a uh, spectrum of light at different wavelengths. So these wavelengths are getting closer and closer together in theory. So go, please excuse my drawing. This is my electromagnetic spectrum. And it goes from long wavelength light to very short wavelength light. So radio waves sit here at the long wavelength light side. And over on the other side, we have things like gamma rays. So this is the gamma wavelength. And somewhere around the middle, is our optical wavelength. So gamma uh, radio waves, sorry, we, they can be anything from kilometers, so maybe 10 to the power of four meters to millimeters, so 10 to the power of minus three meters uh, in wavelength. Our optical wavelength, that would be somewhere in the range of about 10 to the power of minus seven meters. And our gamma wavelength, we're looking at about 10 to the power of minus 12 meters. Now we can also use our spectrum to describe the energy um, carried by these waves. So at the low, at the long wavelength side, this corresponds to low energy waves. And at the other end, we have our high energy waves. 
So radio waves are describing the lower energy uh, wave on the spectrum. And in fact, that the energy of a radio wave from a distant radio source is so low that we have to make up our own new unit um, in order to describe the intensity of a radio signal. And we call that unit the Jansky. So I'm introducing you to a new unit where one Jansky, which we denote by JY, is about 10 to the power of minus 26 of the usual units for intensity we would use. So divide most things by 10 to the power of minus 26, and we're talking about the kind of wavelength, uh, sorry, the kind of intensities of these radio signals. So for example, uh, the radio signal that your mobile phone will receive, that measures at about 10 to the power of 10 Janskis. Uh, the radio signal that the sun uh, is giving off is about 10 to the power of four Janskis. However, the radio signal detected for one of these uh, distant radio sources with these jets is about one Jansky. So we need to be able to build a telescope that's capable of detecting very, very weak signals and also signals from things really, really far away. So another important concept uh, to consider when doing radio astronomy then um, is the concept uh, of resolution. So that's how well your telescope needs to be able to see an object. So for those of you that are keen photographers, you may be familiar with the concept of resolution. It essentially describes the ability to distinguish two small objects as separate objects rather than one. So I'll show you what I mean um, by that here. So here is my uh, homemade video and we've got a cat sticky note uh, stuck to a wall and it's got a black line through the center, okay? Now I'm gonna press play. And you can see that as I start to zoom in or in my case, walk towards uh, the wall, you can see that it may not actually be a solid black line. In fact, it's actually uh, many small dots close together. Now, the point at which we would say this image is resolved is the point at which you can see each individual dot. Um, another video for comparison. This time I'm just walking away. So to start with, this time you know there are individual dots. And as I walk backwards, it appears to look more and more like a solid black line. So the point at which you can then no longer tell that they're individual dots and then it goes into this uh, more blurry line. That's again, the point at which your image would say to be just resolved. Okay, so there's a mathematical formula then um, that relates the resolution of an object to the diameter of a telescope and the wavelength of the light that you're looking at. So this formula is given by, so the resolution, is equal to a constant, which is called 1.22, that's just the value, times the wavelength of the light. So here I'm gonna call that lambda, the Greek letter lambda, to show the wavelength, divided by the diameter of the telescope dish that you're looking at. So as I already mentioned, the wavelength for, for kind of an optical telescope, so, uh, similar to a telescope you could buy for a shop, for example. And so the wavelength for optical light I mentioned was somewhere around 10 to the power of minus seven meters. And the wavelength for a radio light was at its kind of smallest, about a millimeter. So 10 to the power of minus three meters. So we can see already here that if you want to, um, look at the same object at radio weight, at radio with a radio telescope as you do with an optical telescope, you're going to have to have a diameter that's about 10,000 times bigger in order to see the same thing. So in order for the resolution of your telescope to be the same, to see an object in both optical and radio, you need to build a telescope um, with a diameter that's about 10,000 times bigger. 
So let's take a look then at some, some of our optical telescopes and get an idea for what an optical telescope looks like. So this first one on the top left, this is the Grand, Grand Telescopio Canarias in La Palma in the Canary Islands. This is one of the world's largest optical telescopes. So it has a uh, reflecting dish of about 10.4 meters, so 10 meter large dish. Um, our second image here on the right, this is the Hubble Space Telescope. So you may recognize this, this is up in orbit around the Earth. And the resolution on the Hubble Space Telescope is about 0.1 arc seconds. So about a thousand times better than the human eye. So to put that in context, so from its position in orbit around the Earth, Hubble would be able to tell if two people were standing on a beach with uh, beach balls, Hubble would be able to tell, um, like we did with the dots on, on the cat uh, post-it note, Hubble would be able to tell if they were one object or two separate objects, and that's from its orbit in space. So Hubble has excellent resolution. And the third image so shows an introductory level optical telescope that you could buy easily. So these telescopes don't have huge lenses, but using one of these means you could see planets and other objects within our solar system really easily. So you don't need a huge um, diameter for an optical telescope in order to see quite a lot more detail about things in our own uh, solar system. So we've, I've mentioned that a radio telescope, however, needs to have a much, much larger diameter. So let's see what a radio telescope looks like then. So the largest fully steerable radio telescope is this one on the left. This is the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia in America. So it has a diameter of 100 meters across. And by fully steerable, I mean that you can move this in different directions across the sky. So that's the largest um, steerable dish that we have so far, so 100 meters. So that's not quite the 10,000 times larger um, that we need in the optical. This second image on the top right, this is the Arecibo radio telescope. And uh, keen James Bond fans might, might recognize this from uh, the GoldenEye film. I think there's a scene with Pierce Brosnan running down the dish. So this isn't a steerable dish. This can only look uh, directly upwards, essentially, and it always looks at the same part of the sky. And although the Earth is rotating, so you do see different parts, it's then not possible to see, for example, the Southern Hemisphere if you're observing from the Northern Hemisphere. Now, uh, Arecibo, unfortunately, has uh, met an untimely death recently, um, and we can see that in this video here. So here we can see this is the, the, the footage recorded um, of the, the, the complete collapse of this telescope. So it was, a com it was quite an old telescope, so um, a lot of its functions no longer worked anymore, but this was kind of the final straw in that it came completely collapsed in on itself. So I think we can also see a drone um, angle of this, of some of the, uh, the, the wires completely giving up. Um, so here's the moment that, that the uh, supports give way and this ultimately results um, in, in a lot of things falling inwards into the dish. So Arecibo is no longer uh, recording anything, anything useful in the sky. So uh, that's Arecibo. And then on the bottom uh, right of this image, this is the, uh, the VLA radio array. So I've shown you from Arecibo that you, know, you can't steer this. And, you, and Arecibo is about 300 meters wide. So that's about as big as we can build. Um, so you're then limited, really. If you can't build bigger than 100 meters for a single dish, um, that you can steer, then what can we do? And the solution to this comes in the form of building a telescope array. So these are individual radio telescopes that can be linked together to form one giant dish. So the VLA in the image I've shown you, this is 27 uh, individual dishes, each with a diameter of 25 meters. So you link these together and you combine the signals and this forms one huge telescope. 
Okay, so now that we know how to detect radio waves, let, let's have a think about why, for example, uh, you'd want to look at radio emission rather than optical. So say you want to look at, for example, the North Star in the sky, okay? There's a few restraints on when you would be able to observe the North Star. Firstly, you would have to wait until it was dark. So that's not to say that the North Star isn't always there and that it only comes around after the sun sets. It's just that the light from the sun overpowers all the light coming from the stars during the day. Now, this is less of a problem with a radio telescope as the sun isn't a huge emitter of radio waves in comparison to the universe. Therefore, you can use a radio telescope during the day. Now, the other limiting factor you might have is if you wait till nighttime to look at the North Star um, is that it could be cloudy. So if there's clouds in the sky, um, you're not going to be able to see anything. Now, radio waves are completely unaffected by clouds and dust, and therefore it doesn't matter what the weather is, um, which is great if you're building a radio telescope in the UK. So you might be aware that many optical telescopes like the one in uh, La Palma that I showed you, they have to be built on the top of mountains where there's very little cloud cover, but you could build your radio telescope anywhere. And when we move actually further along the electromagnetic spectrum, so if you wanted an X-ray telescope or a gamma ray telescope, well, these waves can't even penetrate the surface of the Earth's atmosphere. So if you want to build one of these telescopes, you have to put your telescope in space. Now, radio telescopes can be built on Earth because all the waves can uh, penetrate through our atmosphere and it makes it much easier to build a telescope if it's on Earth and to fix it if something goes wrong. So where do these radio waves that we want to detect come from and how are they produced then? So in order to um, answer this, I think we need to take a look at this object. So have a think about what object you think this is. And I'll give you a clue. Uh, it's a planet in our solar system. Okay, so I will tell you, in fact, that this, maybe you'll guess it from this image, this is in fact Jupiter. So this image on the left shows the radio emission coming from the planet Jupiter. So you'll notice that there's strong emission at either sides of the kind of main body of the planet. And this is the area that we would call the pole of the planet. And this is because the poles of Jupiter are surrounded by a very important physical phenomena, and that's a magnetic field. So when you have a really strong magnetic field, you get electrons, and these electrons spiral along the field lines and can give off photons. OK, so give off light. So you're, you've got your electrons. And when they interact with the mag a strong magnetic field, they give off light. And it just so happens that this light that's given off is in the radio um, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So therefore, we detect radio waves. And therefore, if you can map the radio emission of an object, then you can infer the presence of a strong magnetic field. So if we return to our Hubble image then, this is a Hubble image showing hundreds of galaxies. So each bright point you can see on this image here, this is a galaxy. And each of those galaxies is containing billions of stars. So lucky for us, at the center of each of these galaxies is a mysterious object that has a very strong magnetic field. And that object is a black hole. So what we could do, we could zoom in to look at uh, just one of these galaxies. So for example, the one in the center. So if we zoomed right into this galaxy and looked at it in the optical, what we would see is all the light coming from all the stars within that galaxy. And if we could zoom in really close, what we might see is an accretion disk of material. So um, kind of like a, a disk of stuff um, swirling around the center and what we would assume at the center is a black hole. So the gravitational pull of our black hole is so strong that stars and things moving around are being pulled apart and you just get a swirl of material close to the center of that black hole. Now, as this material gets closer and closer to the black hole, uh, conservation of momentum 
throws some of the particles back away from the black hole. So imagine you're swinging a ball on a piece of string, okay? And you're swinging it faster and faster around in a circle. If you let go, that ball's gonna fly off sideways, okay? The ball wants to be thrown outwards. And that's similar to some of this stuff moving around in the disc, going really fast. So as a consequence, you can get some streams of particles. So these are mainly electrons and protons that have been thrown out from close to the black hole. So I'm not saying they've been in the black hole and come back out. I'm saying they're thrown out from the disk that's circulating really close to the center. Now, if you combine that with the really strong magnetic fields that black holes have, then we've got the ideal scenario for this synchrotron radiation where the particles are spiraling in this magnetic field and you get radiation at radio wavelengths. So I'll show you a video that uh, shows this then. So what we can see in this video then, we've got our elliptical galaxy, okay? And the reddy orange color that's showing us all the light from dust and stars as it falls towards the black hole. And the greeny blue emission, that's our radio light from the part from the electrons being thrown outwards and giving off photons at radio wavelengths. We can also see the magnetic field lines around which these particles are spiraling. And these jets extend well beyond um, the visible part of the galaxy into the space between other galaxies. And so therefore they play a role in how a galaxy evolves because it's throwing huge amounts of material out into this uh, space between other galaxies. And it's not clear yet whether these jets are emitted continuously. So is the jet always there? Or does the jet only occur when something large falls in and gets thrown out um, of our accretion disk? So looking at the structure of these jets then is really important to working out properties of the black hole, uh, such as how strong is the magnetic field at the center and what is the mass of the magnetic field at the center. And these things are really hard to work out for black holes um, because we can't see them. So we have to use things like jets, which infer their presence in order to work out some properties. So I'll just play that one last time. So we can see that our black hole is kind of eating something and these, uh, as things fall in towards it and some particles are thrown out and so we get our really large jets. Now jets are not always as straight as they appear in this video. So if they were left completely undisturbed by the environment, then they would eject just straight outwards um, and continue on uh, beyond the galaxy. But however, space is full of other stuff. So lots of dust and gas, and this can interact with our jets to produce some really spectacular shapes. So for example, um, this is 3C31. So it's, they don't have very exciting names. Um, they're just named after the survey that detected them. And so we call this one 3C31. So right at the center of that image, that's where the black hole is. Um, and you can see two uh, jets coming out in both directions and they're bright to start with and then they're getting fainter as, as they carry on emitting. And they're both becoming quite wiggly in this uh, image. So this happens when the speed of those jets drops and then they're vulnerable to other gas like X-ray gas. So they can interact with other, other forms of electromagnetic radiation, so not just in the radio, uh, but in the uh, X-ray or the optical as well. And that's causing them to start to wiggle. My next example, this is 3C75. So this is an interesting example. Um, here we have two supermassive black holes. So those are the really bright spots kind of near the, near the lower half of the image. And the kind of swept back appearance of these jets is produced by the rapid motion of the galaxies. So they're moving through uh, other gas within a big cluster of galaxies. 
So this, the, their motion is kind of similar to how if you're on a roller coaster or something, your hair might get swept back because you're moving so fast through it. So these galaxies are moving so fast through their cluster that their tails and their jets are being swept back um, by the environment. And you can see at the top of this image, actually, the two jets are interacting with each other. So we've got four jets in this picture, essentially, two from each of those black holes. And towards the top of the picture, the two jets are interfering with each other. And that can happen if you've got two uh, black holes really close to each other. And the final example I'm gonna show you today is what I like to call the donut galaxy uh, for obvious reasons. Um, this is a galaxy that I looked at for many years and was lucky enough to uh, visit the VLA in New Mexico. So the telescope array that I showed you um, earlier when they were pointing the telescope um, at this object for new observations. So the black, the core of the black hole um, is at the center. So the really bright white bit in the center. And then we've got the main jet sweeping back. Um, so towards the top of the image. And on the opposite side of the jet, however, um, instead of a nice straight jet, what we've got is one that appears to be bent a full 360 degrees round in a circle. Now, this is really rare, um, and there are only a few kind of possible explanations that could explain this motion. The first is that what we could be looking at is kind of a helical motion of the jet, and we're just looking at it face on. So if you imagine um, like a slinky, that stretches like this and it's in a kind of helix that we're just looking straight down the barrel of the slinky so it looks like a circle but it could in fact be a helix and the other option is that there's some kind of turbulent hot gas in the environment that's pushing it round um, but so far we don't actually have any evidence for this hot gas um, at any other wavelength so work on on the donut galaxy is still ongoing so in order to get a better idea then of what's going on with these jets and how they're anchored to their black hole, we need to build bigger and better telescopes. Now I showed you the VLA array, the 27 dishes linked together in the New Mexico desert, but we can go beyond this. What we can do um, is we can link telescopes between different countries and even between different continents. So this, if you linked it between lots of continents around the world, this would be equivalent to building a single dish with the diameter of the Earth. So then we're really approaching that 10,000 times size of the optical and even going beyond the capabilities of an optical telescope. So we're creating a telescope essentially with the diameter of the Earth. Now building the telescopes themselves is easy. Um, you don't need to build the, the individual dishes that large, and we can link together existing dishes. Um, so I don't know if anyone's ever been over to Jodrell Bank in Manchester, for example. So their Laval telescope is part of a network that connects um, to other dishes around the world. So building them isn't the actual problem. One of the biggest problems we have um, at the moment is how to store the data that all these telescopes combined um, a generating. So for example, if you link 20 telescopes together um, across the globe, this requires storage of an exabyte a day. So the exa part of that is 10 to the power of 18. So I'm sure you're aware of megabytes and gigabytes. An exabyte is a billion gigabytes, and that's per day. So say you've got a smartphone, okay, and if your smartphone has storage of what, 64 gigabytes, okay, just a normal, a normal phone, you would need 16 million phones a day in order to store all that data. Another example, if you're on your phone, okay, if you've got your phone and you're browsing all day, so downloading stuff all day, that's maybe 20 megabytes an hour that you're using, you would have to be browsing for 6 million years to use up the same amount of data as an exabyte. 
So working out how to process the data in real time is really important so that you don't have to store all of it. You can work out which bits are useful, which observations are good and get rid of all the other stuff without having to find a way to store an exabyte of data a day. However, when it works and when you can store the data, it works really well. So some of you may have seen this image of a black hole. Um, so this was published in early 2019. And this uses that kind of cross globe technique that we've looked at to produce a really high resolution image of what's going on super close to um, the edge of a black hole. So this uses this event horizon telescope. And you can see the network of telescopes that that's using and that's covering pretty much every continent, including one um, on Antarctica. So that's pretty much covering as much as the globe as possible. And we can then get a really high resolution image. Um, and so more and more arrays like this are being built. And so hopefully over the next decade or so, we'll start to see more and more of these images. Um, so this was of a black hole um, in our neighboring galaxy, but hopefully we can start to look at more and more further away ones and see if there's any similarities or differences. So another goal then that we could start to look at if we can build all these arrays um, are fast radio bursts. So these are radio pulses that we're detecting from space and they last from somewhere around a millisecond. Okay, so, you know, we're talking about a thousand a second. So that's how fast one of these bursts is. And this is caused by some kind of high energy uh, astrophysical process that we don't even understand. And the average single burst um, in a millisecond releases as much energy as the sun does in three days. Okay, so that's in one millisecond, we've got the same amount as energy as the sun in three days. And therefore they must be emitted by an object that's really, really um, energetic at its source. So really high powered object. The first burst was detected in, I think about 2007, um, and more and more are being detected now because we're, we're now starting to look for them. So it's not that they're only just, um, that it's something new that's being emitted, it's just that that was the first one we detected and therefore we're kind of targeting telescopes in order to detect them. So I think in June this year, we detected over 500 of them. So our current best guess um, of what could be producing these fast radio bursts is something we've uh, called a magnetar. Okay, so that sounds a bit like something from science fiction, um, but it, it, it's essentially a type of neutron star with extremely powerful magnetic field. And it's thought that the decay of this magnetic field is what powers the emission of the really high energy radiation. So like other neutron stars, so a neutron star is formed when a really, really massive star um, collapses. So like other neutron stars, magnetars are thought to be about 20 kilometers in diameter. So that's actually really small if you think about it. Um, so less than, so 20 kilometers, less than something like the length of the English Channel. Okay, so you could fit a magnetar in the English Channel. Um, however, the mass of this object that you're putting in the English Channel is about 1.5 to 10 times the mass of the sun. So you're putting an incredibly dense uh, object in the English Channel. And actually, the density of a magnetar is so high, so you've got so much mass in such a small volume, that if you had a teaspoon of it, if you were able to take a teaspoon of your magnetar, it would weigh over a million tonnes. So that's what we suspect may be causing these uh, fast radio bursts. And the active life of a magnetar is actually quite short, so only about 10,000 years. And there's thought to be about 30 million inactive magnetars in the Milky Way. So being able to detect these fast radio bursts would therefore point to where they are. So I've said they're really small, so it's really hard to know where they are. But if you can detect these bursts, you could pinpoint where they are, and we could then draw a map of their distribution around the Milky Way and other galaxies. 
So hopefully that's given you a flavor of some of the exciting physics and astrophysics that can come from looking at the universe at a different wavelength. One of the biggest arrays that's currently being built, um, the Square Kilometer Array, or the SKA, and that's being built between South Africa and Australia, that should be operational mid 2020s, so maybe 2025. And so science from that will start come trickling in uh, in the late decade of the 2020s. So perfect time for any of you students thinking about going to university um, in the next few years and pursuing uh, research in physics and astrophysics. So you, you could be having an active role in analyzing results from one of these new up and coming surveys and investigating some, some of the invisible light in our universe. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Josie. Um, so in terms of questions, I think there are, there are a few questions that have been coming through the Q&A. And um, if anyone wants to add to those, you're welcome to do so. Um, so turning to them, the first one was, you had that really nice video of the radio waves coming from a black hole, um, it, the animation that you showed. Is there a possibility of creating, you know, real observations, real videos of the actual processes, rather than cartoon, as it were? I mean, some of the, the these things are so far away. Um, you know, we're looking at things that are, the, the ones that we call a near are about 500 million light years away. So currently, no, although it's not known, you know, there is evidence that our own Milky Way has at some point emitted light like this, um, but they're just, objects are just too far away um, in order to, to, to do something like that. So we can only make animations or get still kind of images because, you know, that they're, they're emitting for, for millions of years so we can get a kind of snapshot of what it looked like this decade and we could even get one next decade but that's not going to look much different considering yeah. the time scales over which they they emit okay sure uh, and the next question i think one of your slides probably asked that answered this which was how far apart does each telescope have to be for a global array um th there's no kind of set um distance but the better coverage you have the better right so the more telescopes you have the better and the fur you want them to be further apart because then they're looking at a different part of the sky so you want to cover all of the sky essentially with each with the with the combined telescopes and the further apart they are the bigger the distance being covered by them all so ideally you would have some in each continent and that are yeah representing each part of the sky. Okay. Um, another question, how is a magnetar different from a pulsar? Okay, so yeah, it's just by the strength of their magnetic field. So if it's got a super strong magnetic field, we call it a magnetar. And the way to distinguish that is by looking at how fast it rotates. So uh, pulsars rotate really, really fast, like, um, you know, hundreds of times a second, but magnetars actually rotate slower. So if it shows this slower rotation, it's thought to be because it's got such a high magnetic field. So you can say that it's a magnetar rather than a pulsar. Okay, and um, the, with optical telescopes, it's well known that there's a, a lot of controversy about, you know, light pollution in the sky in terms of, you know, things like low orbit kind of satellites. Um, what about with radio astronomy? Is there a problem with suddenly all the background radio transmissions that are occurring um, in the world? Yeah, so, I mean, radio frequencies are, are taken up a lot by communications. So, you, you know, satellite communications, even mobile phone signals, some, some telescopes that I've been to, they can tell when you, as you approach that your mobile phone has not been turned off. Um, so there's a huge amount of interfering signals. There are a few protected bands for astronomy that you, you can't um, transmit signals in and that, that protects a bit of astronomy, but yeah, th there are big problems with um, with communications, it, and you can, you know, that you can extract the signal. But as I said, the signal that you're um, receiving on a mobile phone is, you know, thousands of times stronger than the signal you're receiving from these things from space. So it's quite easy for your signal to be completely dwarfed 
by interference from from things on earth and even things in in buildings nearby and electronics and things like that so it is quite difficult you have to have to know how to extract the signal from from the data okay so there's there's some more questions coming in as we speak um next one is as a radio astronomer how often do you get asked about seti how correct is the physics in the film contact could radio astronomy detect an alien signal well you know the I think if, if it's going to detect a signal, it could well be at radio wavelengths, you know, given the long, um, the long, the long wavelength of a radio signal and the fact that it can penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. So it, a, a gamma ray signal might not reach us because it would be stopped by the atmosphere, but a radio signal could. So, yeah, I mean, it's still an active area of research for that reason. And, but, you know, what is the chance that, the the signal you know we've only been doing radio astronomy for 50 60 years with good instruments so what are the chances that the signal sent was within that 50 60 year period um just have to hope that they keep sending the signals so the, another question if radio waves are low energy how can a magnetar or accretion disk associated with it release so much energy are you not observing the higher energy photons and inferring they're there or is it just some redshifted process? Yeah, good question. So they are they are um, super high energy. They do emit also super high energy, but th there is a distribution. So you do get some at radio wavelengths as well. Okay. And um, given the time, and I promise that we will be as quick as we can, I'm going to finish with a, what I think is a really good question, which is what does an astrophysicist do on a day-to-day -day basis? Oh, it's very exciting. So today, for example, um, the University of York has a new radio dish, a new three meter um, radio dish. So today I was on Astro campus, moving it around the sky and seeing what I could see. Um, I'd, I'd love to say every day was the same. And a lot of telescopes can now be operated remotely. So you don't have to go and you don't have to be there. But some of these telescopes are at such amazing places that sometimes you want to make the case that you do need to be there. Um, I'd, I'd like to be there in person to, to see it point at my specific object in Hawaii, for example. Um, but yeah, now that you can operate these things remotely, I'd say more time is spent just trying to, for me personally, extract the, the good data from the bad data. Yeah. Yeah. So just finish with a couple of, um, again, technical questions. Do we know why magnetars have very strong magnetic field? Um, not really, no. I mean, they're such a new area of investigation. Mm -hmm. We don't know why some pulse, some stars that collapse to neutron stars have a higher magnetic field than others. It could be to do with the, the original mass of the star itself. Um, but yeah, we don't know. Good question. Uh, why are the jets uh, emitted in a straight line? Um, when the, you know, you, you saw those images where you occasionally had things moving around. But it's quite striking how straight line, you know, they were really quite discrete straight lines. Yeah, so it, it's, kind, it's kind of from the conservation of momentum and the fact that we think that it's quite a uh, symmetrical magnetic field from these objects. So they're just they're just spiraling along, essentially. Um, and yeah, unless stopped or deflected, they will just go straight. OK. Well, I think um, we should leave it there in terms of uh, the Q&A session. Um, again, if we were all in a room together, um, we could all, you know, clap, cheer, hoop, and kind of, you know, congratulate Josie on what's been a really, really nice talk. So so thank you, Josie. And, and finally, thank you to all the teachers and parents um, who've come along um, supporting the students. Um, and also throughout the whole period that we've been through over the last year or so, um, being able to support them in, in very difficult circumstances and ensuring that they, the, their talent is, is, uh, comes, comes through and they get the, uh, the recognition they deserve. So it is, it has been wonderful to see um, the array of different talents. And, and I really hope, whether it be in physics or elsewhere, I hope that you've, you've been inspired by, by physics and, uh, and that you, you take it on with you in your career, whatever you end up doing. But I do also hope a lot of you will go on to do university physics and beyond. So thanks very much, everyone.